Okay, so welcome to my talk on stopping the stigma. And as a high school girl right now, you might be looking ahead thinking, what am I going to do for college or university? Um, maybe I'm interested in being a woman in science and engineering. What exactly might that look like? Well, I can give you one, um, one path. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and what I've been through in order for you to uh, get a sense of, of uh, where I'm coming from when I launch into my thoughts. So this is me back in the 80s. Um, I was uh, raised by two people who told me I could do whatever I wanted. Neither of my parents were engineers, but that didn't really matter. Um, they sort of supported me. As you can see by my outfit here, they were not too concerned with making me look dainty. or uh, They always let me get dirty and adventure around and do what I wanted to do. And to this day, they're very, very supportive of me. So my early life the, in the 90s, I, I guess most of you were being born in the 90s, and I was already... Uh, I was in, in band, I was in Girl Guides, I was doing sports, I was doing all kinds of things. And, you know, the early warning signs um, that I now say were the early warning signs of me wanting to be an engineer was that I really wanted to help people and change the world. I was always looking for ways to do things better. I had a very inquisitive mind. Um, I was good at school, but I was a little bit bored at school. I always needed something else to do. I always wanted to be you know, searching and learning and adventuring and doing new things. So maybe that sounds a little bit like you. I don't know. I ended up choosing to go to Queens. Woohoo, Queens, very good school. We, I did materials and metallurgical engineering. And um, I put here, this will mean more to your event organizers than it will to you guys, but I did a whole lot of extracurricular activities, which suited me just fine. I had tons to do. I worked on a science and engineering camp for kids called Science Quest. I worked on a conference which involved talking to grown-up engineers and learning about what they were doing. I was an action frack, which is what my friend and I are posing for. This is our audition here, which is part of the orientation week that welcomes new students to Queens. Um, I was part of my student council, my year exec, the kamikaze team. I don't know if you still have that. That's uh, a group of people that goes out into the community and helps senior citizens in their homes, as well as working at the Interculture Club and the used bookstore. I was one of the managers there in my last year. So it was a great time, and I also learned some stuff. I learned some engineering. I learned some thermodynamics and some math and some really stuff that proved to be really useful in solving problems in the real world. And uh, you can see here we are. My, my year was uh, 2000, so we were Psi double O. And here I am with some very good friends of mine um, celebrating. So my engineering degree was fantastic. It, it allowed me to learn a lot of how the world works, and I knew that I would want to be a part of solving problems in the real world. However, when I graduated, I thought, you know, I've got this really technical degree. How am I going to help people? This is all I've ever wanted to do is help people, right? How am I going to do that using these super technical skills? I don't know if I can make life better because it seems like I really just know a whole lot about stuff. I know a lot about metals, and I know a lot about physics, and I know a lot about math, but I'm not really sure, and this is I call this the valley of despair because I really wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make a difference. But school was over. I had to go somewhere. I went into my first job, and I was working in a factory which made parts for cars. So we were an automotive manufacturer, and I discovered continuous improvement, which was this method of problem solving um, that allowed us to make things work better within the factory. And this little graphic you see here on the right, that's a, fur that's a belt furnace, and this was this gigantic um, piece of equipment that we had in the factory, and when I first started there, it was breaking, pardon me, it was breaking down over and over and over again, and this was very frustrating, very costly, even maybe dangerous to the people that were working in the factory, the way it would break down, um, and so I was part of a team that helped pull together different clues and different aspects of the root causes of why it was happening. And this was the where I learned this problem-solving method called continuous improvement. I thought, wow, this is really cool because we were able to stop this furnace from breaking down, and that meant that we were making lives better, the lives of those people that were working in the factory better. So I was like, oh, look, I am helping people. This is great. I helped about 120 people. Not too shabby for uh, someone that just came out of engineering school, is not really sure what they're doing, and uh, I wasn't even really sure if I should be an engineer at that point, to be honest. But then I started, I went through my next two jobs, I moved to another company called Magna Powertrain, that's a Canadian automotive company. Um, I learned another problem solving methodology called Six Sigma, and now because I'd gotten a bit better at it, I was now running these problem solving teams, and I was pulling together people 
from all of the different departments within the companies to figure out, okay, what are the next problems that we can solve, that we can make things run better, we can make them safer, we can make the factory pollute less. I was working in automotive manufacturing. A lot of people don't think of that as very fun or interesting or creative, but I found because I was working with people and I was working with problems and I could tell I was really making a difference, um, I found that that was a great use of my skills and I was very, very happy. I realized, phew, it's good I became an engineer. This is something I love doing. Um, and because I love to talk to people, I also got put in charge of the employee suggestion program. So I was now listening to ideas from 400 people working within the factory. And they have a lot of good ideas. You know, sometimes we think like, oh, someone who's working in an hourly worker factory job, um, they might not have very many ideas. But they do. They have lots of time to think. And they're really smart in a way that maybe even engineers or people that are more highly educated are not. There's really a lot of different types of intelligence out there in the world. So I was really, um, I was really honored to get the chance to talk to them about their ideas and help get some of them implemented and get them recognition for the ideas that they had. So then uh, around about 2005, I ended up a, ch a chance encounter in the grocery store with a friend of a friend, and this is how these things sometimes happen. Uh, I wound up working for a gold mining company. So completely different industry, totally different environment. I was no longer wearing you know, safety shoes and eyeglasses to work every day. I was dressing up in suits. I needed to look good because I was in downtown Toronto working on Bay Street, working for Barrick Gold, this, this gold mining company. And I learned Lean, which is another problem-solving methodology. So I'm starting to get lots of problem-solving tools in my kit um, to add to my engineering background, which was great. And I started to get involved a little bit more on the financial side. So great, we solved this problem, you know, in the factory or in this case in the mine. Um, how much money is that saving us? And how do you sort of have to break down what was going on before and what's going on now to help you understand how much money you're saving? Because money, let's not kid ourselves, money is very important, especially working in companies, uh, working in business. So I was able to sort of um, broaden my skill set even further, and I got put in charge of designing a best practices system. So this means I was taking now 20,000 people working worldwide across this big gold mining company. I was now in charge of trying to get their best ideas, sort of like I did at the factory, but now on a whole other scale, um, getting their best ideas and pulling them together and helping share out those good ideas throughout the company so that we could share them and, and get the most out of them. So I was facilitating conversations on a global scale and applying my skills in a, in a brand new way that was really leading and inspiring others. So this was great. This was, this was a really good situation for me. And I got my first year performance appraisal and they said, you know, you're doing really well but you need more operations experience. You need to go where the action is. We need you to go to our operations. And so this was the beginning of my international relocation phase of my life. I worked and lived. I don't know if anyone recognizes this flag. This is the flag of Peru in South America, which meant I had to learn Spanish. So that was an interesting adventure. Um, I did it. It turns out it's amazing what you can do when you absolutely have to. When no one speaks English, you can make yourself understood through you know, rudimentary vocabulary and uh, arm gestures and sound effects. It was pretty pretty comical. I think people had a, a good laugh at, uh, at my expense. But they also knew that they could learn a lot from me because of the training that I had um, in these problem-solving methodologies. So this is me at my apartment in Lima. I was right on the ocean. It was a, an amazing experience. Um, and then this is me doing, doing my thing, uh, doing some problem-solving. In this case, you can see I'm holding a piece of wire um, and this has gotten caught in one of the pieces of the machinery, and uh, we were doing a continuous improvement project to get rid of that problem so that we could have uh, fewer breakdowns in this particular piece of equipment. So I don't know about you, but this to me was completely thrilling to be able to practice what I'm doing, be able to live in another part of the world, learning different culture, different language, different food, everything, and Peru is just amazing. If you ever have a chance to go there, if you've been there, you already know um, it's, a, it's a wonderful country. Um, and one of the things that I noticed when I was there that I did not expect um, was the poverty. And when you leave Canada, you start to understand the rest of the world is not in the same economic situation that we are. We do have poverty in Canada, but in the other parts of the world, it is it is very immediate and very severe. And I remember at that point my, my heart paused and took a note 
and said, you know, if I can ever be part of the solution um, in helping those people, I don't know how exactly, and I'm, I'm really busy with my job right now, but I want to do that at some point. So that was sort of a, another key. I put these little keys here so you can sort of see this. these are the, the things that I learned that were most important. When you get home from international relocation, there's not always a job waiting for you. That was something that happened to me. Um, I worked on contract for the company for a little while and then ended up leaving the, the mining company and decided because it was January and it was Canada and I had no particular thing to do that I would, um, that I would take off and go traveling again. So I went back to South America, spent some time in the Caribbean. This is me in Cuba learning how to salsa dance. Um, and this is me in Ecuador working at a wildlife reserve. I thought, you know what? Nothing to do with engineering. Maybe I want to take my life in a whole other direction. Maybe I want to try, um, you know, helping animals or helping babies or doing something completely different, really exercising my human side instead of my engineering side. Um, but as it turned out, working in the jungle at that wildlife uh, echo reserve, I ended up realizing I could do both. I didn't have to throw away my skills as an engineer in order to help people. I could do both because this uh, wildlife reserve place that was designed to rescue animals um, that had been trafficked as pets, rehabilitate them so they could be released to the wild, um, they have systems, they have processes, they have problems just like a factory, just like a mine. They have things that can be improved. And I found myself as I was going about my day-to-day -day chores as a volunteer, I really wanted to optimize the crap out of everything, same as I'd always wanted to do since I was a kid. And that's when I got the message. I, I thought, you know, this is part of who I am. This is part of what I do. And as fun as it was to be on the beach in Spain here, and here I am hanging out with my friend in San Francisco, um, I, I didn't just want to be, you know, a lady of leisure for the rest of my life. I was kind of bored. I wanted problems to solve. I wanted things to do. I wanted to feel like I had a purpose. So I decided at that point, what if I could take my engineering skills and use them in a different context to help really make a difference in the world? So this is how I ended up doing this volunteer project in Argentina. Um, there's a lot to say about this project, but basically I was working with a group of, of urban recyclers. So these are people who are surviving by taking recyclables out of the garbage, out of the streets, so they're not in a very secure economic position, obviously. These are these are you know, people who are not well off. And uh, we worked with them to give them a, a press. You can see this is the press here. Um, we had it built. It was very affordable. We got them a micro loan for their cooperative so they could so they could afford to purchase the, the piece of equipment. So basically they had the ability to move from scavenging, which is a very difficult way of life, doesn't make you very much money, to making some stuff uh, using the plastics that they were finding. So I don't have pictures of all the stuff that they made, but they did some really great stuff. They were able to basically become small-scale small, small scale manufacturers and business owners. Um, so a bit more dignity and a bit more security and, and the ability to help themselves out of poverty. And this was a great use of my skills as an engineer. And obviously I was working in Spanish. I was working in a, a different uh, cultural context, uh, working with people from a different sector of society. Um, it's, it's a very sensitive thing. It's not an easy thing. But I found I was able to get 100% of what I wanted um, in terms of helping people. So. I can tell you, based on my own experience, I have the data to prove it, you can use engineering and science, for that matter, to do lots of different things, including helping people. That degree and that skill set in you, when you cultivate it, you get good at it, you get willing to apply it sort of out of the box, it can really open doors for you. And if you want adventure, man, put your skills in your bag and go. It's absolutely um, tons of opportunity out there for you if that's something you think you might want to do. Um, something else I learned was also, you know, you spend so much time thinking, well, I'm an engineer, I'm smart, I can do all this complicated math and science stuff, this is great, you know. I also learned everyone is smart, you know, just as I was saying, those factory workers, they have observations, they have ideas that they've come up with that, that you wouldn't think of um, and that a very, you know, more highly academic person might not come up with. Um, it's really important to be humble and to respect the boundaries of what you know and to give acknowledgement to what other people know as well. Whether they're studying another discipline, um, whether they're working in, in uh, you know, coming from another cultural point of view, learning how to see the good in what they do and how you can work together 
to achieve a bigger goal, that's amazing. That is really what I think is one of the keys to success for anybody, not just for women, but for anybody. Um, if you're going to go into, if you're going to go into, uh, a, you know, sort of an engineering or science uh, career, learning how to respect that diversity and partner, you know, play well with others, <laughs> sort of like in kindergarten, um, learning to respect what other people bring to the table as well. It's okay to be proud of what you know, uh, but you don't want to be arrogant about it. Um, and entrepreneurship is really fun and exhausting. So that's kind of the lead into what I'm doing right now. I help companies do things more efficiently, basically doing on a consulting basis what I used to do as an employee. Um, so I started my own company, Erica Lee Consulting, and that inspired me to start coaching and mentorship for engineering students because I could see that you know the, the aha moments that I had could be passed on to other engineering students who were maybe feeling that valley of despair that I felt back in the day as well. So Engineer Your Life was the name of the, of the platform that I came up with. So what am I doing now? Um, I did find time in all of this to get married. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family, my friends. Um, this is a group of women entrepreneurs that I meet up with occasionally. We are all, all over the United States and Canada. A couple of them are actually engineers, which is really neat. Um, and I don't have any kids of my own yet, but this is me with my, my wonderful godson um, and with my grandfather. So I have a pretty good life. I, I think, you know, where I've settled right now, I'm very happy. I, I think being an engineer was a key, key part of that. And so I have to say, when I got asked to do this talk and I thought about stigma, let's stop the stigma. Okay, great. Well, what stigma is there? I did this. I, you know, I talk all the time to people about how important women in engineering is, how important diversity is, how women can be successful, just as successful and, and valuable as men, how we can partner effectively together. I really had to stop and think for a minute. No, okay, wait, I know there is a stigma. Let me think a little bit about what some of those negative messages were going to be. And for the record, these messages are all crap. None of this is true. But I thought for the sake of argument, I'm going to bring up some of the things that I know I heard, I didn't listen luckily, and you might be hearing these days, and I hope you're not listening either, um, because these, you know, they're just ridiculous and not even true. So what do girls get told um, that could prevent them from continuing on and becoming an engineer or becoming, you know, all that they're meant to be, whatever career that they choose? Well, what about you shouldn't be smart? It's not, it's not good for you to be smart. You should be nice. Um, or you're, you're smart, but you're not the right kind of smart. You're distracting the boys. I heard this one from a, a grade 7 student who told me that, you know, she really likes math and she really likes chess and she, you know, it's mostly the boys that are interested in that, so she ends up hanging out with the boys and she got told by a teacher, you know, maybe you shouldn't go to this upcoming tournament because you're distracting the boys. And my heart just broke for her. I thought, boy, that, that is just really tough. And I, I would say, you know, not that well advised on the part of that teacher to be taking that position. You should be more girly. Okay, we'll talk about that as well. Um, or you should be good. Like, like being an engineer or having problem solving skills or being skillful or being interested in a, in a field that's supposed to be for boys makes you bad or, or dangerous or not a, a good girl or whatever. I don't know. So those were some of the things I thought of that maybe you're hearing. I want to tell you, totally not true, totally optional whether you listen to them or not, by the way. Because I see the problem in two parts, and I'm going to explain to you why I don't think either part is really valid. One problem I think we have that sort of the general population might assume is they assume that your gender, whether you're a boy or a girl, that explains everything about you, that that sort of puts you in a box one way or the other. You're this or you're that. And they also assume that women can't contribute value to a traditionally male profession. And you notice I've got that in quotation marks for a reason, because I actually don't think it's a male profession at all. It may happen to have a lot of men in it, you know, this engineering and science field, um, but that's... That's, an, that's just a coincidence. That doesn't mean that that's how it should be or how it always has to be. So the problem with gender categories, and I, I assembled this from a, from a course that I took a little while ago uh, when I was broadening my mind beyond all of that math and calculus. Um, there's sort of this masculine way of being that's very external, it's very mental, it separates things, it boxes things off, it's got structure, 
It's all about control. It's very angular. It's very decisive. Um, it's all about doing and having goals and being purpose-driven. That's sort of what we call the masculine. And we may say, okay, men, most men are like that. They're, they're in their heads. They like to think. They're, they're always about goals and doing things. Um, they're ordered. Most men, you know, um, they, they make the money. They're the provider. They're ordered. Um, I mean, it's not true, right? It's just an idea that we have about masculine and about, and about men. And over here, we've got feminine. And oh, it's, it's all, as you can see, it's the total opposite each time. It's the internal that matches the external, the emotional that matches the mental. Relatedness, flow, surrender, roundedness, being soft, just being about being, not necessarily doing anything, just being, just the presence. Um, intention, being about love instead of purpose. Are we all getting along? Is everything okay? Are we, we're nurturing, we're looking after other people instead of ourselves. Um, we're being nesters um, instead of providers. We're taking care of the home. Again, very traditional, very sort of um, one-dimensional way of looking at women and saying that women are like that. So the thing is, and I'll be the first to say this, if there's a stigma against it, well, that's just too bad. I draw from both of these columns, and I imagine a lot of you do too. And maybe there is a stigma about that that says, oh, you should be more in the feminine column all the time. That's how we expect you to be. That's what we're comfortable with. But the fact is, all of us, every single human being, is a blend of both. We, at times, we're goal-driven. At times, we're purpose-driven. At times, we're logical when we're doing our math test. We are over here. We are in this gear. This is not who we are. This is how we operate at times. And when we're talking with our friends and we're feeling feeling the love and we're bonding, you know, that's when the, the love side and the nurturing side comes out of us. And I personally operate in both gears every day of my life. And I think that that's really important for us to understand and make peace with and not let anyone tell you that you have to be one or the other or that it's bad for you to be... Um, I don't know, to be assertive or to go after what you want, like, oh, that makes you a bad girl because you're acting like a boy. Like, heck no. <laughs> you're allowed to pull from both columns to be just exactly who you are. And I think we need to let everybody do that. Another thing is understanding what is engineering anyway. Remember I was saying that I don't really think this is a male profession. It's got men in it, but that doesn't mean it has to be male. Well, when I look at my career especially and when I talk to my friends and colleagues about what they're doing, at a fundamental level, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll go into the technical gobbledygook if you let them, but when you really boil it down, what are they doing? They're solving problems. They're looking at what's going on, trying to make it better. They're improving systems, which is an, a neat skill in itself to look at a whole system and learn how to analyze it and come up with ways to make it work better as a whole not just one part of it, but the whole system. Um, innovating, inventing, they're taking new solutions, right? So maybe there was an old solution in place and they're coming up with a different way of doing something. They're making things work. And I think this is something that I personally take real pride in as an engineer, that we don't just come up with problems. We don't just come up with, oh, well, it shouldn't be like this and that shouldn't be like that and this is problematic. That's something that, you know, a lot of um, sort of academic people will do. We engineers, we're in the real world. We are on the ground. We are making things work. We're saying, you know what, it's not a perfect solution, but it does work. You know, for example, the, um, the space shuttle. It got us to outer space many times. Was it perfect? No, of course not. There were tons of things that could have been optimized and could have been better, and it blew up a few times, which is not good either. But it did basically work. And when you think about the fact that these days, you know, we landed, uh, we landed a, a vehicle on a comet, we're doing all kinds of amazing, amazing things in science and engineering these days because we have these people who are willing to make things work and push forward in a less than perfect world. Um, protecting public safety, taking care of people, whether that's making sure that the water is clean, that the, you know, the car isn't blowing up, the bridge isn't falling down. Um, that's taking care of people. What is that? That's nurturing, right? That's, that's taking care of people. That's an emotional impulse. If we were only being logical, we maybe wouldn't care so much when those things went wrong. But engineering does have that protective quality. So, um, so anyway, here is, here is me making the case 
that engineering involves a lot of different things, and and uh, it, it's a mix of the this sort of what we think of as masculine and what we think of as feminine, turning ideas into reality. There is nothing messier than the creative process, the design process, where you're iterating and you're trying different things out. When you think about the types of skills and the types of people we need to do this work, we don't just need those hard-edged, logical people. We need the people who can communicate. We need the people who are creative. We need the people who really care, really care, you know, and can get enthusiastic and can get passionate and can get someone to follow your idea. And whether that's a man or a woman, we need to respect that diversity of skills and those types of people and bring them together. Another thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is that engineering is not this sort of cut off profession that sits on its own. It pairs well, like a wine, it pairs well with many different things, including medicine. And I found this awesome graphic, so I thought I'd share it with the way engineering, life sciences, and medicine come together. So a lot of kids, and I bet a lot of your classmates, want to be doctors. They think, boy, that's a cool profession. Um, it's a great way to help people, great way to save lives. That's something important. Um, maybe they want to make lots of money too, and doctors generally make make good money, which is which is maybe a consideration. Um, I'm fond of saying when I do my presentations, I say, who do you think saves more lives, engineers or doctors? Most people think it's doctors, but when you look at it over the course of history, with all of the things that engineering has contributed, especially water and sanitation, um, they they have prevented more deaths than doctors have saved, which I think is kind of cool. So you, there are all these different areas. Once you get an engineering degree, you can decide that you want to add something else to it, um, something like a business degree. Lots of my friends have gotten MBAs, which stands for Master of Business Administration. I have a friend who is a, a patent lawyer, so she's an engineer and a lawyer. She has her law degree as well. Some people go into policy or go into government and figure out, okay, knowing what we know about the science of, for example, climate change or um, public transportation. What are the best laws that we should put in place? What policies should we have? What rules should we make for ourselves so that society can continue to work better? So boy, you want to help people, you want to serve. Um, there's, really a, there's really no better way to do it than to take a basic understanding of how the world works, how the materials of the world interact with each other, um, and add it to something else. And you can do something like a, like an engineering and, and uh, political science combination. That's super, super cool. So there are lots of different doors and opportunities. This slide actually says, what are engineers working on? And this is something I'm really fond of talking about. Um, if you're less than inspired by the idea of going into an automotive factory, and making a belt furnace run, you know, I would say walk before you run kind of thing, um, as I did. However, um, there are some big sticky problems out there in the 21st century. They're called wicked problems. We've solved most of the easy stuff. You know, we've got the internal combustion engine down. That's, that's pretty good. We've optimized that. We're now looking at the next level. How do we make things more sustainable? How do we make things more globally just? How do we solve the problem of poverty? Um, how do we get uh, solar energy to be economical? Um, for example, we're, we're spending all of this time online. We live our lives online right now. We're really vulnerable to hackers and, and online theft unless we have good computer scientists and, and computer engineers um, and programmers working together to come up with tools that can protect us. So there are so many different worlds, so many different areas where you can take your skills and apply them, but they all sort of start with that basic understanding of how things work, the ability to solve problems. And to be honest, it's, it's your heart as well. It's your passion for making things better that's going to make you truly successful. So I think I'm just about getting to the end of my time. I wanted to give you a few concrete thoughts on what I think the keys are to stopping the stigma. And I think the first thing we need to do is embrace, let's call it assertiveness, or that go-getter attitude. Let's embrace that in women. And I love this quote from Sheryl Sandberg. She says, I want every little girl who's told she's bossy to be told instead that she has leadership skills. And what a great example of how we can encourage little girls and little boys who have big ideas and who want people to follow them um, rather than say to them, hey, you're bossy, stop doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. Say, hey, what's your idea? Let's go. Let's try it. And I think that's a, that's a bigger shift. There's a whole social 
um, sort of way of thinking around how girls should be and how girls are. I have, I have this little graphic here at the bottom that shows two women kind of eyeing each other down. This whole idea that we have to be in competition with each other, that we have to tear each other down, um, I think is just really bogus. And I think that if we all make a conscious effort to say, hey, you know, you're, you're with me, you're on my team, um, there is, there's lots to go around, whatever we're fighting about, it's, it's an illusion, there are lots of boys to go around, there's lots of attention to go around, there's lots of success to go around, and the more you succeed, the more I have doors open for me to succeed as well. So seeing each other, not as competitors, but as how we can collaborate and help each other and lift each other up. This is probably a good philosophy to have with boys too, eventually, but I see it especially important between girls, um, you know, people who say girls are catty and they're always tearing each other down. I don't believe that's our true nature. I think that's what happens when socialization and our insecurities get the better of us sometimes, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so that's my first key. Second key, the flip side to that. How often do we make fun of men for, oh, he likes to bake or, oh, he doesn't want to fight or he's not being manly enough, quote unquote. And I personally, I really dislike this idea that we make fun of men by comparing them to women. I, I think that's so unhelpful. It's insulting to women, first of all, because it's saying the worst thing you can be is is feminine or like a woman. And, and that's not true because women are wonderful in their own ways. They They are valuable and they are um, very important. They have a lot to contribute as well in a completely different way than men do, than masculinity does. So I would propose that we all ban this type of making fun of men or telling them, you know, you can't be, you can't be sensitive or you can't be emotional, you can't be artsy without being told, um, you know, you're not, you're not a real man or you're, there's something wrong with you. Um, and so I, I guess, I hope you can see that this sort of goes both ways. We're saying let women be assertive, be powerful, be in charge, go into male-dominated professions. Um, I think we can do it the other way around, too. Let people be people is kind of what I'm saying here. So there's no reason that men can't pursue whatever they want to do and just let them be themselves. Let's, let's get out of this idea of boxes. Um, the boys go over here and the girls go over here. Let's all just let ourselves be because we have so much potential and we have so much to give. We're all going to be that much happier when we let ourselves just be. The third thing I want to say is stake your claim. I am inviting you today to decide that you want to do this. If you think you want to be an engineer or if you want to be a scientist, go for it. Start saying, I am a scientist. I'm a future scientist. I'm going to be a scientist. I'm going to be an engineer. Why not? Because as much as there may be barriers, you might get negative messages. You might be told you can't do it it doesn't actually matter at all. You can go ahead, you can make it happen. Um, the beliefs that we have about ourselves and the things we tell ourselves are so much more important because they're echoing in your head all the time. And if you've got a positive soundtrack playing in there, you'll find that the negative voices will, they'll turn away from you. And, and I have to say, it took me a while, even after I graduated from engineering, I didn't entirely call myself an engineer. I wasn't sure I had what it took. I, was, I didn't feel necessarily invited to be an engineer. I didn't even know if I belonged in the club. Um, but I'm saying to you right now, you can just decide that you belong. And I think this is something that traditionally men, boys, are a little bit better at than we are. Um, they stake their claim. They don't even think about it. So I think this is a place where we can, we can do that too. Um, and get the real story about working in engineering. This does pertain, by the way, to science and technology careers. I just mostly talk about engineering because that's what I know. And there are four things that I want you to know about engineering. We have a diverse set of challenges. Remember that slide I showed you with the cyberspace and the uh, nuclear terror and the carbon sequestration and, and uh, solar energy? There's so many problems out there in the world. Pick the one that feels most important to you or the area where you think you're going to be most excited to contribute. And, and, um, and you, can, you can make a contribution there. We need all different types of people. We need some people to identify the problems. We need some people to research solutions. We need some people to dream big, crazy thoughts. Then we need some people to run the feasibility on, well, this is what you, this is what'll work, this is what won't. We need designers. We need all kinds of skills. We need people to work together. 
in order to actually bring those solutions forward. Hi, here I am. Um, so engineering and technology, they shape the world around us. Um, so important to understand that. The world that we move in, that we interact with every day, I mean, gosh, my phone, um, even this cup I'm drinking out of, this is an engineered material. Um, literally everything that you interact with in your world, it, it's been shaped or designed somehow by engineers and engineering. And isn't it fun to recognize that what we've done so far is just one way. It's just one idea. We can do anything we want in the future. We have the tools. We have the technology. What if we decide we want the world to be different? What if we decide we want different people to have access to different things? Or what if we decide we want new products to exist? This is the key. You can decide. You can have your finger on the ability to make those things happen, which I think is just so cool and inspiring. I love this idea. I hope you guys are getting excited too. Um, understanding that engineering and technology, really any, any sort of career where you're taking something that was just an idea and you're turning it into a reality. I mean, that's kind of awesome. You need a ton of creativity and a ton of imagination, which are not necessarily things that we associate with these types of careers. We think of math and we think of science and we think of you know, being very logical and very analytical. And it's true, that's important. You have to be good at that, that's a, that's a part of it. Um, but in order to really advance, really get somewhere, we need those creative and imagination. We need people that are good at communicating, people who are good at scheduling, um, people who are good at managing their time, people who are good at establishing relationships. Um, all kinds of different skills are necessary to really make that thing move and get it off the ground. And I personally am super excited to see what happens in 10 and 15 years when we start to get more of a gender balance and when we start to get more people who are creative and communicative as well as technical. Um, I'm really excited to see what happens to the profession because I think it's a change that we all agree is necessary, that we need uh, people who represent the population that we're serving, not just you know one type of person in the profession. And finally, engineering is essential to the safety, health, and happiness and comfort of our friends, family, and distant neighbors. So these are people working for people. This is a people profession. It's a caring profession. It's a way that you can really make a difference in the world. So that's a story that's not being told very often, in my opinion, and it's maybe not being told very well. Um, but it is, it is true. It is tr the truth about engineering. And this is part of what I'm doing as part of my work with Engineers Without Borders is um, as Engineers of Tomorrow uh, is the name of my venture. And we talk all about this side of engineering, this way of explaining what engineering is and how we can change the future. So thank you so much for your time. I'm going to leave you with a list of things to Google. Um, because I think that these are super important. I've probably touched on a million different topics. I hope you have some questions for me, and we can maybe do a little bit of uh, Q&A now. I want to encourage you to go to wemadeit.ca. This is an amazing website that was put together by high school girls for high school girls to help them understand engineering. And it explores topics that I'm sure are interest, of interest to you. And if you've ever looked at other engineering outreach websites for a certain university or a certain association, maybe you found they don't exactly match what you're interested in. Maybe they use a lot of words that don't make sense to you. We Made It is not like that. And I really encourage you to check it out. And it would be awesome if you want to tell them what you think about it or send some feedback to them. Because there are uh, some friends of mine I was involved uh, a little bit in getting the, uh, getting the website up and running. So great, great project there. Please check it out, wemadeit.ca. If you're interested in learning more about those big sticky problems, um, they can be a little challenging, a little, uh, a little depressing, a little overwhelming, but there's a lot of cool stuff going on in those different fields as well. Google Grand Challenges of Engineering um, to learn more. It's sort of the engineer's to-do list for the future, all the big problems that people are working on. I'm not sure if you've heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's a famous astrophysicist in the States who does a lot of talking to kids about uh, being, a, being a professional scientist. And he talks to a five-year-old girl it's absolutely amazing. Go Google it. Go find it. Um, you can look up Engineers of Tomorrow. Again, that's my venture. I'm on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Um, and you, you can see links to a lot of the things I'm talking about here. Um, a Whole New Engineer is a book written by an amazing engineering professor who sees uh, the change that we need to make in engineering education. 
um, and talks about engineering in this whole new way as well. Also, Goldie Blocks, just because it's fun. Not sure if you've heard of Goldie Blocks, but it's a it's a, a toy for for girls, uh, probably younger than all of you, but heck, it's still fun. Um, it's sort of like a Lego type uh, toy that has uh, a story it's about a girl inventor. So it was invented by a female engineer who decided that she wanted to have um, sort of some more options for girls to play with so they could understand uh, what engineering is and how it works. So thank you so much for your time. I would love to see you again. If you could put on your webcam again, that would be fantastic. And if we have time for a couple of questions, I would be happy to answer them.